Hey, this is Scott from writeaboutdragons.com. Um, I'm here today with Met Ivy Harrison. She's a published author. She has um, six, is it, books published? Mm -hmm. A couple upcoming. Um, she has a PhD in German literature from Princeton and a German BA from BYU, our very own BYU, where I'm from and Brandon is. And um, yeah, so she just has tons of great writing advice you can find online. And today we're just going to interview her and see um, what she has to say. So, um, Matt, the first question I have is, um, in one of your blog posts you mentioned how, how becoming a writer, a published writer, is a lot like, like winning American Idol or, <clears throat> or like the X Factor. Like you've got to go through this process. Because you maybe like go through that process in your own, in your own writing career, like... How you, how you actually got published, essentially. Yeah, sure. So the, part of the reason I wrote about it is because my daughter actually went to an audition for The X Factor. And um, she's a singer. She has many dreams about becoming, you know, a star. Um, and I tell her constantly, like, I don't know anything about music. <laughs> I actually started learning to play the piano when she started taking lessons. When she was about 12 or 13, I was driving her 30 minutes each way to her lessons, and I thought, if I'm gonna be doing that, I might as well get lessons myself. I, I kind of always wanted to learn how to play an instrument and never really had. So anyway, I, I started taking lessons with her, but the only thing I know about music is, is things that I've learned in the last five years, and I practice maybe 20 minutes a day, so still limited. Anyway, um, I took her off to audition for The X Factor, I think it was in 2010. And she has done other auditions. She did, she auditioned for America's Got Talent um, when she was 11, so in uh, 2008, and um, this was our second time. And so I had a little bit of more of an idea of how it worked. I've been surprised at how often my lessons from writing can be applied to the music career. I suppose just because it's an artistic career and, and the arts do have a lot in common. So one of the first steps to going is you have to figure out where the auditions take place. So for a writer, I think that that is similar to finding out how to send out manuscripts. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times people will come to me, just neighbors, who will say, you know, I have a friend or my granddaughter wants to submit and she doesn't know what to do. They literally have no idea, like, do you type out the manuscript? Do you send it to an agent first? Do you send it to um, an editor? And how do you get the addresses for these people? Are they secret information? <laughs> um, this is the sort of information that you find out if you follow um, things online. So if, if you're doing X Factor auditions, you have to go to the X Factor webpage and they'll have all the information. You have to wait for a specific time. They allow you to audition and you have to go to the location that they tell you to do. So for the writing world, that means you have to wait for the specific um, window. Sometimes publishing houses only have certain windows when they allow people to submit manuscripts and you also have to um, follow the rules. <laughs> Now, sometimes the rules may seem ridiculous in the writing world, but you still have to follow the rules. A lot of the times the rules seem like they're set up on purpose to just make things hard for you. Um, for, for these auditions, I think to myself, seriously, how hard would it be for an, a company like this to set up auditions in 20 different cities instead of the three cities that they set them up in? The reality is, I know they pretend that the judges are actually there. The judges are not there <laughs> on the open audition days. Um, they just have a bunch of crew, like camera crew is just there taking a video of the people who are auditioning. And then someone picks out who they like and then there's secondary auditions where the judges actually come based on these um, primary auditions. They could literally open it up to anyone to send a video online to them just as well as they could do this. Why do they make you go to this particular location? It's because they think that making you go to this location weeds out a lot of people who are less dedicated and aren't as good. They just, they get less submissions that way and that's actually something they want. In the writing world, it's still the same way. It's obviously easier to send anything email, but most editors, it, it's changing right now, but many editors still do not accept anything but paper submissions. They simply do it because it cuts down on the number of people who send in submissions. So that's the first step finding out what the rules are, finding out where you go, how you send your manuscript in. Once you figure that so, out. Could you summarize like maybe 
what, so like, people who don't know, like, what is that? Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> so it's so obvious to me. Um, yes, so neighbors come to me. How do you find out this information? Easiest source um, for somebody who doesn't know how to get along on the computer is to go to the library. They have a book called um, Guide to the Literary Marketplace that has names and addresses of almost every literary agent. You do have to go through a lot of slog to figure out if that person is interested at all in the genre that you're writing in, which means you have to know what genre you are writing in. Are you writing in the ch children's genre? Children's includes everything from picture book to middle grade, which is um, Brandon's um, uh, Alcatraz. Alcatraz series, to young adult, which is um, Holly Black and Liberate. Some, for, for lay people, it can be hard sometimes to distinguish between young adult and adult, but technically those are all children's. So that's a big umbrella, but adult is a huge umbrella that includes romance, fantasy, science fiction, um, horror, you know, almost everything. Nonfiction is a huge umbrella. So but you've got to know what those terms are. And um, so Literary Marketplace is a good place to go. Writer's Digest publishes gigantic tomes every year that have... Um, magazine uh, addresses where you can send to editors of a magazine if you have a magazine piece. Uh, short stories would be magazine pieces. Um, you can also uh, get book publisher information from Writer's Digest. Again, they'll have it in categories, um, children's books, adults books, nonfiction and fiction, divided that way. So you find out the name of the editor. I should warn people in advance. Um, the names of the editors that are typically listed are that nobody's trying to lie to you, but frequently those youngest editors, the ones who are acquisitions editors, um, move around a lot. Honestly, sometimes they will last two to three months. This is perfectly normal in the world of publishing. So if you get a name in Writer's Digest, that name was collected at least nine months ago, the likelihood that that person is still there is maybe 20 to 30%. So, I mean, you still send it, you can still send it to that person's name or you can just send it to acquisitions editor. Either one is usually fine. Um, and people actually do read it. I, I think sometimes people feel like they're sending it into the black hole. The chances of being published this way are minuscule. Nonetheless, it does happen. And um, so I'll get to my publishing story. I actually was published by sending a book through this very method. I found an editor's name in Writer's Digest and sent it off to her. So did you just send like a, what's I sent called? a proposal, which is a proposal is um, a summary, usually a one to two page plot summary of your book, plus the first three chapters. That's generally what people think of as a proposal. But again, follow the guidelines as exactly as possible. Every single publisher will have a different list of what they want. And that's why you go to the book, because you find out not only the address, but you find out if they're interested in only a query. Many, edit, many publishers and editors will not look at anything but a query. Some will not look at anything. And honestly, if they say they do not accept unsolicited submissions, they are absolutely serious. If you send them to something, they will just dump it in the mail. I mean, dump it in the garbage. Or they will send it directly back to you. They are not joking about that. Most places, you have to have an agent, which is why I suggest the Literary Marketplace rather than the Writer's Digest. Literary Marketplace has all the agents. And you're going to need an agent anyway, so you might as well start getting one now. <laughs> Um, Did you submit it to both editors and agents? No, I, I wouldn't recommend submitting to editors and agents at the same time. I, I understand the temptation to do that. The problem is that if you end up getting an agent, the agent will be very frustrated that you have already sent to editors and gotten no's from them. Some, a lot of times an agent will want to do revisions with you and then send it off to editors. Um, and they, they'll feel like they have a better chance of getting a yes if you give them the chance to do that before you've collected all these no's. Y yes, they can resubmit, but it makes their job harder and it m makes them feel like you're not being a professional. So they, they request that you send to them. I would say never ever submit exclusively to an agent. Um, if an agent demands an exclusive submission, I would either not submit to them or lie to them. I don't know, should I say that? Maybe I wouldn't lie, but I would say in the letter, I am multiply, I am submitting this to many agents at the same time, just so they know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think they have any right to ask you to wait for the year it will sometimes take an agent to get to you. But anyway, yeah, you need that information first. From The first step is figuring out what you're going to do with the manuscript. I mean, of course, before that is writing the manuscript, which is another whole, whole process. And it, it really shouldn't be forgotten about because... Like with my daughter, a lot of the time what happens is that you get a no, and the no just means 
you know, you didn't do your work before you came. You, you're not good enough yet to even be really considered seriously. And I think it, for me, one of the reasons as a writer that I made my daughter, I, I shouldn't say I made her, she desperately wanted to go to these auditions. I knew that the chances were minuscule that she would be taken. I think she's brilliant, but she was also 11 and 14 the two times that we went to these big auditions. And I thought the likelihood that she would get in was very, very small. The likelihood that she was going to end up crying at the end of the day was very, very high. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, as the mom, was going to have to deal with my teenage daughter crying um, at the end of the day. I accepted that as a possibility. And I think as writers, you should accept that rejection is extremely likely. Yeah, I'm not saying you don't cry over it. We all cry over being rejected. Mm -hmm. It's painful. But knowing that that's the way it's going to be, the way it's likely to be, I think will help you to have a, a plan for how to go forward. I think one of the reasons I was successful was um, my sister, when I was 12, married a man, Rick Walton, who is a picture book writer. And although he and I don't write similar manuscripts at all, he showed me very clearly how you break into the business. And it was by writing a zillion manuscripts and sending them out one at a time. He would finish a manuscript, get it critiqued, revise it, send it out. And then as soon as he sent it out, he would work on something else. There was no lag time. There was no like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen with that manuscript. I mean, you do that wonder that for a tiny moment, but mostly you're just working on something else. And I, for my daughter, that was true. You know, I mean, you, you look at the audition information and you don't stop taking your music lessons. You continue to work. So you, you plan in advance. And another part of that is you need to have money reserved to, um, to get these opportunities. Um, in addition to the sending the manuscript out, which is a fairly standard and relatively inexpensive, although it does cost some money, um, there are other opportunities for you to pitch manuscripts. And I'll, I'll just describe a few of them. In the children's book world, there's a, uh, an organization called SCBWI, SCBWI. I know that's an acronym that I say very easily now, but probably is difficult for, for everybody else. Um, it means Society of Children's Writers, Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. So Skib We, there is a Utah-based um, chapter of Skib We. There's a national chapter, but the Utah chapter has regular conferences. And the conferences cost you know, anywhere from $100 to $200 for a local conference. They are worth the money if you can at all go to them. They don't cost a lot of money in terms of travel. So they're in Utah. It's great in that sense. You don't have to pay the transportation cost of going to them. But if you want to go to the national conferences, they can be enormously helpful. Um, as a beginner, you should be aware that unless you have a set time when you're to pitch to an agent or an editor, don't be pitching to people right and left just because you meet somebody. Just be a, like an interesting human being somebody that they would enjoy having a conversation with or would enjoy going to lunch with. Of course, if you have the opportunity to take somebody to lunch, take them to lunch. But again, don't pitch your book the whole time. Um, if they ask you about your book, you're welcome to mention it. Just use good you know, manners and behavior at a conference like this. But you do need to have money set aside. Just like opening any other business, you've got to have some um, money ready to spend to um, earn money back. And I would guess most people are going to spend five years spending money on writing before they earn anything back. And it will probably be 10 years before they've earned back the investment they made the first five years. Um, so I don't know if you have a rich parent who can uh, help you. You've got to have a laptop. Obviously, you've got to have um, some sort of word processing software. You need access to the internet. Um, I think Twitter is a great place to go uh, to find editors and sometimes there are editors who will say on Twitter, I'm looking for this. Um, you're welcome to submit to them, but don't submit to them on Twitter. You submit to them in a regular way. I have never found that to be a particularly useful way <laughs> to, um, like, to do my writing because I have my own ideas about what I want to write and if an editor says I want this, I'm not going to drop everything I'm interested in and write what they're interested in because I'm not likely to, you know, write what they're interested in well. But if you happen to have a match, you know, that's great. And I have a story. I did actually sell a book based on a Facebook contact. Um, my daughter wanted to be on Facebook and I'd never been on Facebook and thought Facebook was boring. So I went on Facebook just purely to watch her um, interactions with other people and ended up meeting an editor on Facebook 
who I'd worked with before and was interested in working with again. And we ended up selling a book over the next four or five months after I first joined Facebook. So again, these are places where you begin, um, you make an investment and you're just getting started in the audition process, really. This isn't even the audition. This is like to get ready for the audition. These are the sorts of things that you have to have in place. It's like kind of in the X factor. The first audition really is just like a, not really audition, it's just like a weed out tons of stuff. Or... Yes, that's definitely, but, but I'm talking about, this is still like before the first submission. Oh, right. <laughs> so yes, th it's true that in the X factor, the, f the first auditions are, largely weeding people out, but that's also true of the publishing business. They reject 99% of all manuscripts that are submitted to them. Nonetheless, you still have to go through that process. You still have to prepare for and then submit through that regular process where you would likely, 99 times out of 100, you're gonna be rejected. You still have to do that over and over and over again. There's no way out of it. There's no special magic. I remember when I was a writer, when I was, a, when I was trying to break in, I was friends, sort of, with Lois McMaster Bujold, who's one of my heroes. I ended up writing her a bunch of letters, and she, for whatever reason, out of the goodness of her heart, wrote me back, and we sort of stroke up a correspondence. And I ended up asking her to read one of my manuscripts early, early on. I do not know why she agreed to do that. <laughs> she was very gracious. She read the first three chapters and sent me back some information. Um, but she, I remember asking her, like, I feel like I'm so close, and I just need a little bit of help, and. And I, I think I somehow expected that she would be able to give me that help. Now I look back and realize that's not what you can... Writers cannot help other writers in that way. The way we can help them is to help get them contacts with agents and editors. But really, you, the writer, have to be producing manuscripts that are so good. And I used to say this all the time. I have not said this in a while. You have to produce something so good an editor can't say no. I, it, it has to be better than the, the manuscripts that are being sent in by the currently published authors. I think most beginning writers do not understand that. They will read something by somebody else and they will think, oh, I can write. I can write that good. You don't have to write that good. You have to write better. You have to write so well that they cannot refuse you. Um, and until you're at the level where you're writing so well that it's obvious to everyone that this is brilliant, you're not going to be guaranteed an in. And the idea that somehow other people are going to um, be able to help you skip steps is just silly. It doesn't happen. Not, not in my experience. Um, mm -hmm. There's no skipping steps. Well, this all sounds like a friend experience. I mean, he wrote. 10, yes. He wrote ten books before he got published. Like these are hundred thousand. Right, bigger than mine. I wrote twenty, but his are probably twice as big as mine. Yes. And I think that's pretty much the way you should expect it to be. He probably spent, you know, five years. Like yeah. I say, five years is about. Because what you're doing is you're putting yourself through college. You're putting yourself through a college called learning how to be a writer. <laughs> and it will take five years, just like it would take five years to finish college before you get to the point where you are um, beginning. Again, it's just a beginning that you're, you're, you're crossing this threshold. Just like when you graduate from college, you, people who are in college imagine that when they graduate suddenly like job offers will start shooting through the walls at them and like life will be easy but this is not true anybody who's actually graduated from college realizes there's often the sense of like let down that you had this idea that if if you just finish and you do all this work and if i just do this and just do this and just do this and then you reach the end of it and you realize oh now I, you go through commencement right where they say now you're just beginning real life <laughs> you've just barely learned the skills to start being a grown-up, right. but you're still a baby grown-up, and you're still going to be a baby writer when you've, when you've gotten your first mm -hmm. manuscript um, ready to submit. So, um, right. so should I talk about the next step? Yeah. So the next step, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so we we knew where where the auditions were. We had money set aside. We bought airplane tickets. We set. We got a hotel room, um, and then we get on the airplane and we arrive at. Um, the auditions, which is was not easy. I did not know how to drive in LA, and uh, we were driving around for hours. And um, well, yeah, a couple of hours it took me to find the place. I ended up waiting in a line for a long time, which turned out to be a line for people getting citizenship in LA, not the line that I wanted to be in. So I don't know. Maybe there's a lesson in that that sometimes you're standing in the wrong line. Actually, there is a lesson in that. 
because when I was starting out as a writer, I didn't know what I was good at writing. Um, I, I talk about this sometimes that one of the problems of becoming a writer is just because you like reading a lot of different genres does not mean that you are going to be suited to writing in those genres. And as a writer yourself, you may not be able to tell what genres you are suited to writing in. Just because you enjoy writing them doesn't mean you're good at it. You need feedback from other people to tell you, this is not really the direction for you. <laughs> you know, you may be just, like I, my first novel that's published is actually a contemporary novel. And I think I did a fine job. It's, it's decent work. I'm not at all um, embarrassed about it. It's a good book, but I don't think it's shown. It wasn't like, oh yeah, this writer's so unique. But when I wrote my first fantasy, Mirror Mirror, about um, the Snow White fairy tale, but it's so weird and twisted, and it's about what happens to the mirror and the queen, like before Snow White ever comes on the stage, and then there's, I don't talk about Snow White really more than one sentence, and then everything else happens 100 years after the evil queen is dead. And um, when people read it, inevitably I get the response of like, wow, that is really original. And you want to have that. So if you're waiting in the wrong line, you may be in for a really long wait. So I was trying to publish um, contemporary fiction for a long time. I did eventually get um, The Monster in Me published, but I think if I hadn't realized that I was waiting in the wrong line and that I should have been in the fantasy line, it might have been a shorter wait. But you know, I don't know how you find out that except by some experience. So yeah, so, so we finally got in the right line and um, uh, we went to this gigantic building um, and there's this line outside the building and we get in the line and we wait for about an hour and then um, somebody comes up and says, okay, it's time to go into the building. So we walked over and um, the camera started shooting everybody and they had this woman come out who was, I guess, in charge of hyping us all up and people were holding signs, what we're supposed to be shouting and they're trying to crowd us all into this tiny, tiny space. Obviously, this was because they were going to be shooting this film for, you know, the, the episode on the LA auditions, and they wanted to, it to look like there was a massive, massive number of people. If you've ever seen American Idol or any of the audition shows, they always do this long camera angle to make it look like there's 50 billion people waiting in line. They really fake a lot of that. <laughs> So we were smashed into this, and we were all excited, and they're like, just one minute, you guys are going to be going in there, and yeah, yeah, so we were all shouting and everything, and then when they were done filming, then they said, okay, everybody get back in line. <laughs> so yeah, then we got back in line, and we waited in this first line, and the first line that you wait in is to get your number. So you wait in the line to get your number, and that allows you then to wait in the line of the people who have numbers, <laughs> and this is like writing in that... Um, writing for many people feels like a series of lines. And I should say that you might as well get used to waiting in line because it doesn't end when you get your first book published. I know that many beginning writers believe that if only they get their first book published, then they will never have to wait in a line again. This is untrue. Every professional writer that I know, even New York Times bestselling writers, Shannon Hale, Holly Black, Libba Bray, <laughs> They all have to wait in line over and over again. And by waiting in line, I mean they have to write a manuscript first. They don't all, none of those writers that I've just listed are writers where the publisher will give them money in advance for anything they care to write. They have to write the manuscript first. Sometimes they can get away with writing a partial and a proposal, like a, a summary of it, but they have to do a, quite a bit of the work up front. And um, then they have to wait for the editors to read it. Sometimes their agent will send it out to multiple editors, but they are going to be waiting in line to see, you know, which editors are interested. And once you get an editor interested, so you're waiting in this line for a number, and then when you've got a number, you get to go and wait in the next line. And the next line is the line to be allowed into the waiting room. <laughs> I'm dead serious. So we waited another four hours after we got our number to be allowed to sit in the waiting room. Now, the advantage of being in the waiting room was that they had film crew going around in the waiting room. So if you were doing interesting things in the waiting room, there was a potential that the film crew might come over and, and interview you. And in fact, one woman who was sitting next to us, I think she did actually end up being on the show. She, was, she did animal sounds. This was, if you go back years ago, this is 2008. The woman doing animal sounds at the LA audition, we were sitting right next to her. 
And the interesting thing to me was at these auditions, um, the editor would would roll the tape and she would talk for a while and he would say, okay, stop. And then he would say, okay, let's do this again and this is what I want you to say. <laughs> and they would redo it over and over again until she said it quickly enough and in the way that he, the, the editor wanted it said in order for him to be able to put it um, on TV. But the idea that she had all these ideas all herself about what to say it was false. She was pretty much told what to say. Maybe some part of it was original. Um, so as a writer, you're going into this waiting room. And I think that that is, for a lot of writers, after you've finished your manuscript, you're so excited because you finally have an agent. Like getting a, getting a number in these audition lines is like getting an agent. That means you have the special privilege of going into the waiting room. <laughs> the waiting room of waiting to be published. Um, and it's a big step. I mean, it is really important, and people wait a long time to get into that waiting room, but it's not actually being published. <laughs> and it can be disappointing when, if you imagine that as soon as you get an agent, you will automatically be published. I know many, many authors who signed with an agent and two years later have still not published a book. But this doesn't really mean anything about them as authors. Um, it just means that the agent can't sell that book for whatever reason. The, the marketplace, the editors are not looking for that kind of book. It doesn't mean that the book isn't a good book. It just means that it's not selling right now. And if you as an author are in that waiting room and all you're doing is twiddling your thumbs for the two years that you're in that waiting room, you're going to be pretty sad <laughs> because after the two years, your agent will likely come to you and say, what else do you have? We need to send something else out. So in essence, it's going to feel a little bit like you're going back even further in line. You have to start writing again and then wait to be let back into the waiting room to hear what you know the editors and or agents are going to say about the manuscript. So I guess my, my lesson there is you know, keep writing. If you feel like you're in the waiting room, get your laptop out and do something with it. Don't just think that you're going to be, you know, scooped into fame. Um, you, no matter what level of fame that you have as a writer, you're still going to be having to write books. Other people aren't going to be doing it for you. So get out your laptop and keep working. You're in the waiting room and you feel like you're in with a hundred people, only a hundred people, and some of them got to be end up you know, on TV. So you've got a way better chance now. In, in the writing world, you know, the statistic is often 99% of manuscripts are rejected. And that is a true statistic. However, it is somewhat misleading in that 80% of those manuscripts that are being rejected are manuscripts rejected for the simplest of reasons. And I think some writers are not aware of how often the mistakes made for those 80% of manuscripts are ridiculously simple. Things such as sending a manuscript to someone who does not publish that kind of book. You do not know how often that happens. So, so often <laughs> I've heard editors complain. They just are like, hello, I work at Tor. We do not publish picture books at Tor. Well, you know, Tor is a, an adult science fiction fantasy house only. If you're not writing science fiction and fantasy, do not submit to them. I mean... In addition to being annoying, it's just a waste of everyone's time. So 80%, a lot of those are being rejected because of that. A lot are being rejected because they're just absolute dribble. Some of them written, yes, truly by convicts um, or by people who do not speak English well enough to be being published. Sadly, I mean, you just have to be able to write English very well. Um, you can't have a tongue typos. You can't type your manuscript like you are tweeting it <laughs> with no capitalization. Um, uh, so uh, that 80%, once you're past that 80%, you've got actually a 1 in 20 chance. Once you're in the waiting room, shall we say, with an agent, I suspect your chances are 1 in 20 that that manuscript that you're working on right now will be published in some form. That isn't still a 100% chance, but it's a much better chance. Mm -hmm. um, so you sit in the waiting room, um, and finally your number is called and you've been waiting for, for us, we've been waiting for 10 hours. For an 11 year old, that was pretty hard. And this 11 year old has ADD. <laughs> so she was kind of going crazy. Um, we finally are allowed into this room where there's yet another line, but a much smaller line of only about 30 people. And we knew that at that point, when you're in this smaller line, 
you go into this room and there was actual singing happening in that room. That is, an audition was happening in that room. So we were closer to the moment of, um, you know, of, of reality, of, of the thing we'd waited for. So we waited another 20 minutes in the much smaller line. And then we walked into the room. And in this particular case, I was allowed to go in the room with my daughter because she was younger. Um, and so they, for liability issues, I think they liked parents to be in the room. But the parents were all to sit or to stand to the side and not speak and not do anything. We weren't to help or coach the kids or anything. So at that point, my daughter had 20 seconds to sing a piece, I think. So she was allowed to sing for 20 seconds and they had people who were taping her and um, these were not the judges that you see on TV. <laughs> these were, but in reality, these are probably the people who make most of the real decisions. It's one of the things I've realized. They pretend on TV that the judges are saying yes or no, but by the time anyone gets to the judges, they have already been, it's already been decided whether they're going to be on the show or not. You know, like with, with 80% accuracy, because the judges, like when you're watching on TV, it's so obvious whether they're good or bad. The only people that end up on TV are people who are absolutely terrible, like hilariously funny in their bad singing, or people who are absolutely wonderful and there's no question. So the decision making has really happened long before that. So these people who appear to be peons, who are in the actual audition room, it feels like a letdown, but it's actually the most important people. And this has a, a good corollary, I think, to the world of writing because um, as a writer, sometimes you will end up feeling like you're sending your manuscript off to some agent or editor and the only person who responds is the assistant. This is not a bad thing. Having an assistant respond is really important. You want to have the assistant of your, if you know an editor has an assistant, you want to have that assistant on your side because that assistant is the person who's putting manuscripts in front of the editor. Sure, the editor is still going to be choosing which one of those manuscripts are going to be published, but a good assistant is going to have at least a 50% guess rate on what manuscript the editor chooses. So an another mistake I think I made early on in my life was um, I had a manuscript that I brought to a conference and um, an editor was at the conference, and she was like the executive editor at Random House, so really a big wig. And she liked the manuscript, and she wanted me to send it to her. But it turned out by bizarre coincidence that I already had a manuscript that another editor in the house was looking at, seriously. And so the executive editor emailed me and said, um, she said, I, I don't want to take you from this other editor that you're already working with, so I'm just going to send the manuscript that I liked to her. To me, it felt like, Losing my chance to work with a really, really important editor, and she's just gonna hand me off to this lower peon who doesn't know anything about publishing. And I felt horribly let down, and I wanted to, I didn't do it, thank goodness, but I did want to email her back and say, Please, please let me work with you instead. Now, the reason that would have been a mistake is that the big wig editor actually has almost no time to do editing, <laughs> and um. She ended up only staying at the house for another six or eight months and then left and went and did something else really, really important. But the editor, the junior editor, who I actually never ended up publishing anything with, she looked at multiple manuscripts of mine, seriously. Um, she did a lot of editing and she stayed at that publishing house for like 10 years, which is almost unheard of in the business. Um, but if you find somebody who stayed at a house for 10 years, they, they know the ins and outs. They know the um, the marketing director, they know the plan, they know how to talk to people in the department, they know who the president is, they know how to talk to the president's assistant, they just know stuff that's going to be really, really useful. So don't be mistaken into thinking you only want to work with the top editor. If you're in science fiction, you know, you might think, I want to work with David Hartwell, you know, but he's really busy. <laughs> You probably are better off li working with Liz Gritsky or, you know, one of the more junior editors. Liz is probably still too busy now. Get somebody who's really the lowest on the totem pole. Um, for me, uh, my, my agent, Barry Goldblatt, who's a big name in the field now, uh, when I signed with him in 2000, um, I signed with him his first three months in the agenting business. And he was a beginning agent, and I think a lot of people thought, uh, why would you sign with somebody who has no experience? But he, he'd worked in publishing 
in various other ways. He'd worked in contract, uh, in the contracting department. And um, he's been a great agent. And he's very loyal to me, even when I make idiotic mistakes, which I do fairly often. Sorry, Barry. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and so finding somebody who's new is either a new agent who's hungry or a new editor who's hungry. Often the best choice for a new author to find somebody who's low on the totem pole. So don't, don't imagine that when you get into that audition room, you want to see the judges. The judges are the ones who are not actually making the decisions. They're just on TV to look good. <laughs> and they, I think a lot of the stuff they, they say is, is um, scripted for them. They're, just, they're really just actors. Anyway, so you go through this audition process. My daughter got to sing for 20 seconds. And then she was, she was told, okay, thank you, and goodbye. And that was it. Literally, she sang for her 20 seconds. She was recorded, and they said, we will contact you if we're interested in more. And then um, in one case, we just left the room. In another case, we were actually escorted by security guards to the outside door, and they made very certain that we did not ever take a step back closer into the building. They wanted to make sure that everybody left. I suspect because they have a lot of trouble with people who are angry and become violent after they've been told no. Um, so they escort everyone out immediately. There's no going back. You cannot wait for other friends. Um, and I think in the publishing world, uh, if you've been told no, it, sometimes it feels like, now what do I do? Like, you, you've worked on a manuscript, you spent you know, f the five years becoming a good writer, and you have a manuscript that's so perfect that you think, and your agent sends it around, and you feel like you're in the audition room, and you've got the perfect editor, a young, hungry editor, and then the editor says no. It can be devastating. You're escorted out of the room, and all you have to do, you just have to go home. You fly on that stupid airplane back to your house, and everybody's like, how did it go? And everybody's excited for you, and you're like, nothing. Nothing happened. It's terrible. My life is over. <laughs> That's what it, it feels like, because everybody around you is so excited for you, and for you to explain to them, yeah. You know, nothing happened. It feels really depressing. And to get the energy back to then begin on a new manuscript. Because sometimes what happens is there are things that are wrong in a manuscript that even though it's so interesting, and but that can't be fixed. I, I hate to say that. It, I have My friend Holly Black have, and I have a disagreement about this. Holly believes that any manuscript can be saved. But my opinion is that Holly's idea of saving a manuscript is essentially the same as throwing it out and starting over again. <laughs> sure, she'd have some of the same ideas, maybe a character's name is the same, but her idea of reworking a manuscript ends up making it so different anyway that I would call it just starting over again. But you do have to start over again, and you have to do everything from the beginning. Sometimes your agent will drop you, and then you feel again like you've been escorted out. Sometimes an editor will leave the business that you've worked with for a while or who seems you know to really be a champion of yours and you feel like you're right back at rock bottom starting again and you've got to you know look at the auditions again and sometimes you do ask yourself is this really what I want to spend the rest of my life doing so if you're lucky and you get through that audition room and you have a junior editor who says I love this manuscript or an agent who says I love this manuscript I want to sell it then you're one of those lucky few um, you know, American Idol says, I think, that they get 20,000 people out to most of their auditions. And, and on TV, you end up seeing 20 of those people. So if you're the one in a 1,000 who gets chosen to come back for the, ne the final round of auditions, that's great. It's great. But it still doesn't actually mean that you sold your manuscript. <laughs> because I, I know this will be sad, sad information to many beginning writers. An editor cannot buy your manuscript just because your editor loves it. It used to be true. It is no longer true. Publishing houses are owned by gigantic conglomerate corporations. And um, they have to get... An editor is only one arm, one part of the organization. An editor has to get every editor in the organization to agree that they want to buy this book. That means the editor has to somehow get these other editors to read your manuscript. I, I don't know if you understand how hard it is to get editors to do that because to read a manuscript carefully enough to know that you want to recommend it, it's going to take 10 hours for most editors. And that's for not a Brandon Sanderson-sized manuscript, like a regular young adult-sized manuscript. 
And um, to get multiple colleagues to be able to read your manuscript and agree with you that it's perfect is so hard. So an editor could love your manuscript and still get stopped by other editors saying, I don't love it. Not it's bad, but just I don't love it. That's all. If the editor does say, come back for your second round of editions, and I'm going to get all of these editors to love your manuscript, there's still another hurdle after that, which is getting marketing on board. And um, in order to get marketing on board, your editor has to do a uh, spreadsheet proving how your book will be profitable. And they do this by um, going through and making a list of, man of, of published books that they think are similar to yours. And not in the way that you want. Like, of course, everybody wants to be like, my book is the next Harry Potter, and so you should look at Harry Potter's sales numbers. No editor will use Harry Potter because, first of all, that's unrealistic. Second of all, it will make other people mad. Um, so you don't use Harry Potter, but you try to find something else that's reasonable. You don't want to make it sound like, you know, you're being irrational. So they'll find a, a set of other books that have sold moderately well, and they'll say, you know, this book sold 20,000 copies, and so we think we can afford to give the author this advance. And then in addition to that, they have to say, we think the book cover will cost this much money to pay for the illustrator. We think that the production of the book will cost this much. And they actually have to sit down and talk about like, nitty-gritty things that really you and I would never notice and don't care about, but things like what font they're going to use, whether they're going to have a special letter at the beginning of each chapter that's larger so that the designer has to choose, has to pay for, you know, those extra letters. Are they going to have a special little curly cue, you know, at the top of every page? Um, are they going, what kind of paper are they going to use? What weight is it going to be? How is your book going to be bound? Is it going to be paper or soft bound? Um, and there are actually some varieties in between. I don't know enough about the business really to explain everything. But... They have to sit down and, and explain in great detail what every single one of your, um, what each book will cost, what they think the initial print run should be, and then submit this to the president of the company and a, a committee that will get together. And, and marketing then has to sign off and say, yes, we believe this book is marketable. Marketing is the group of people who not only do, excuse me, not only do things like um, uh, make posters and and uh, write up ads to be published. Um, they also do the very important work of going to, into bookstores and talking the Barnes and Noble rep, who is vastly important. I think you have no idea how important Barnes and Noble is. If your book does not get into Barnes and Noble, good luck to you. It will sell less than 5,000 copies, which for some people you can survive on that, but a publisher is not gonna be happy with that as a choice. You need to get into Barnes and Noble. Um, and so they have got to talk that Barnes & Noble rep into getting your book into the stores, at least in some quantity. Maybe they, they don't want to co commit to buying 10,000 copies, but if they can commit to 100 copies even, it's better than nothing. So those marketing people are so invaluable. They've got to be behind your book. If they're not behind your book, they're not going to work very hard for you. They won't, they, your book isn't going to be one of the ones they bring up when they talk to the Barnes & Noble marketing rep, or they'll just mention it in passing and they won't try to push it hard. So you're kind of hoes. <laughs> um, you want to get everybody in that big committee. So when your editor says, I'm taking your book to committee, that's what the editor means. It means she's got to convince, or he, mostly she, has got to convince all of the other editors, yes, this is the book we want to do. And then she has to convince the publisher that there's a viable plan that this book is going to be profitable, including your advance as a writer. And, and they're going to base the amount of money they give you as a writer on, you know, whether the editor's marketing plan makes sense. And then marketing has to also think, now, see, the marketing people don't care how well your book is written. They could care less about that. They only care about whether people are going to pick it up. <laughs> That's the main thing that marketing wants them to do. Once a person has picked up your book, the likelihood they buy it is so high, you know, compared to when they don't pick up your book. So um, cover, um, back cover copy, copy is really important. Other things that you have no control over that marketing has control over, like, um, in-store displays, um, magazine ads, stuff like that. Really great to have marketing on your side. So you've got to have that whole package. Then finally, so so if we're going back to like the X Factor or American Idol auditions, if you are one of those lucky one out of um, a thousand who gets called back to the final auditions, you go in front of the judges 
the final judges, and they say yes or no, um, then you get to be on the show. So to me, being on the American Idol show, or being in the top 20 of, of American Idol, is like your book being accepted, you getting an actual contract. Now, once you get on the show, your book is published, it's out there, there's no guarantee that people are going to love it. <laughs> so um, uh, it's going to take a lot of extra work even after you get published, even if you're on the show. There's no guarantee that being on the show means that you're going to make any money. Um, so I guess that's another t topic of conversation is how you figure out how you are going to help market your book. Mostly, I would say my best advice to writers is once you have gotten the book to that point, yes, do everything that you can to promote it. Um, and when I say promote it, I mean not in obnoxious ways. So if somebody invites you to a book signing, go to a book signing. You can even invite, you can even offer to do book signings. Don't be pressured, don't pressure bookstore owners to um, bring you in if they don't want to, but you can offer to go in for free to do book signings. You can offer to do school visits or library visits. Um, and I recommend having a blog where you post information about your book, having a website. Um, but mostly, write another book. Like, if you crap out of American Idol um, and you don't make it past the first round, that doesn't mean your career is over. There are people who, you know, if you are a devotee of American Idol, you know that Jennifer Hudson was, like, number eight and she got cut. And she's been the most successful of everybody in that season. And then um, who's the... Chris Daughtry. Yeah, Daughtry, yeah. Daughtry was number three, I think, and then he got cut. He didn't win the year he was in, but it's obviously the most successful, except for Carrie Underwood, person who's ever come out of American Idol. Kelly Clarkson. Oh, and Kelly Clarkson, yeah, those two. So, um, just because your book doesn't do well on that first, you know, hoop after you have been published does not mean that your career is over. Work on another book. Sometimes it's just the beginning of... Uh, getting exposure and your book may not take off so right okay so that kind of sums it up um because <clears throat> you made me diagram it actually like it's like it's step by step sure That's awesome i am diagramming each step right it's nice to have oh, a little visual uh -huh. thing